St. Paul Public Schools families, and thank you so much for taking some time to, to join me this evening. Uh, hopefully you're somewhere cool. I see it's still 97 degrees outside. I uh, can definitely feel it. I guess it is uh, the end of the school year. Uh, this is typically what we're greeted by in these um, uh, beginning days of June. Um, I don't have to tell you this uh, end of the school year is like no other in, in so many ways. Um, and tonight I uh, want to share some sadness with you. Uh, as I announced the passing of our board chair, Marty Zhang, uh, continues to be extremely difficult. Uh, many of you know uh, yesterday a family announced that uh, Chair Zhang passed. And um, just terribly sad. Uh, Marty challenged me in such an intense way for our students and for our community. She did it with strategic direction and the combination of a fierce but incredibly loving heart. I want to share one thing with you about Marnie that I know to be 100% true. Marnie Zhang loved St. Paul, Minnesota, which means she loved each of you. She wanted and expected the very best for SPPS students, families, and staff. Today, I will honor her by reading the statement released by the Zhang family. Our hearts are in pieces as we share the news that our beloved daughter and sister, Marty Zhang, passed away on Sunday, June 7th, following a month-long courageous battle with the coronavirus. We prepared a celebration for her return and waited, and waited, but she never came home. We prayed and prayed for a miracle, but none was granted. Marty Zhang, 31, grew up on the east side of St. Paul and was a proud student of St. Paul Public Schools. She attended Longfellow Elementary, Washington Middle School, and Arlington High School, graduating in the class of 2007. She graduated from the University of Minnesota Duluth with a BA in political science and a minor in African and African American studies in 2012. She was a school administrative manager at Mung International Academy in the Minneapolis Public Schools. In 2017, Marty was elected to the St. Paul School Board. She was elected chair of the board in 2020. Marty will be remembered as an inspiring community organizer, a courageous leader, and fierce champion for education, gender equity, and racial justice. She was a selfless public servant who made the community's problems her duty to solve. To those who knew her, Marty was more than a loving daughter, aunt, niece, cousin, a devoted friend and sister. She was beautiful. She was a book of generosity and fire. Marty's parents, Zahua Zhang and Si Zhang, came to Minnesota's political refugees from the CIA's secret war in Laos. They instilled education, family, hard work, and public service in all their children. As the youngest daughter, Marty began her leadership at home and as an NJROTC cadet at Arlington High School. Marty fought for racial justice. She dedicated almost all of her adult life towards education because she believed education was a foundation to dismantling structural racism. Marnie was a union and community organizer at Take Action Minnesota and the SEIU. Marnie has gone back to the ancestors far away in the sky where all Hmong people come from. She is survived by her parents, Ahua Zhang and Si Zhang, two sisters, five brothers, two brother-in-laws and a sister-in-law, and four nieces and nephews and a large extended family. We thank all the hospital staff, doctors, nurses, assistants for taking great care of Marnie at Regents Hospital and the University of Minnesota Fairview Hospital. Marty was a person who likes to give and doesn't like to ask for help. However, she, was, she has accrued medical expenses for her care. The family has set up a GoFundMe account on her behalf. And I ask today that if you, feel, uh, if you would feel so kind to, to uh, generously give, you may do so. Marty loves to smile and make people smile. Mark Twain once wrote, wrinkles should merely indicate where smiles have been. The funeral arrangements will be shared in the coming weeks. At this time, we ask for privacy as we grieve and do not dwell on how she passed, but on how she lived. SPPS family, could I ask us to bow our heads for a moment of silence for our board chair and friend, Marnie Zhang. Thank you. On Monday, May 25th, George Floyd was murdered by a member of the Minneapolis Police Department. His murder set off a seismic wave of emotions through our community, our nation, and even the world. 
Today, Mr. Floyd is being laid to rest in his hometown of Houston, Texas, with family, friends, and an entire world mourning his loss. I want to acknowledge the violent and peaceful protests that soon amassed in the hours and days following Mr. Floyd's murder. As if to say another black person, a black man has been killed by law enforcement. George was helpless in handcuffs. He was not a safety threat and for more than the graphic and barbaric eight minutes and 46 seconds that are forever emblematic with his murder. George Floyd was hunted, stripped of his rights, stripped of his humanity. And at this time, a community, a city, a state, a nation and a world has spoken united to say this must stop. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights was prominently displayed as I visited the National Center for Civil and Human Rights with my son in Atlanta about a year ago. And it says, recognition of the inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. As evidenced by our two beloved cities, St. Paul and Minneapolis, the recognition of these inherent qualities have not been felt both past and present. My heart goes out to you who live near or witness the devastation to our community, including our very own Gordon Parks High School. And those of you who know our students and families that have been deeply, deeply impacted. Some of you reached out to me personally. I called you back to understand your emotion, your hurt, and let you know that I care. We must work to eliminate racism in all of its forms. I have received numerous calls, emails, and I've had phone calls regarding practices and behaviors that are racially biased, harmful, and destructive, and it must stop. This is the first quarter of school in 27 years that I have not witnessed the out-of-school suspension of a Black child. Whether at Lincoln Elementary, Tokyo Middle, or La High School in Madison, any of the Burnsville Lincoln Savage schools, and now right here in SPPS, it has never happened. It took the forced closure of our schools during a global pandemic to achieve this milestone, and each of us needs to think about that. I will continue to gather information from you, all of you, about your experiences with racism and SPPS. I will ask questions about your schools, about your colleagues, about our students, and confront myself with, am I doing enough? I Can't Breathe should not be a destination for Black children or adults. We must, have, we must take the collective knee off of our communities and our schools. And I say to the world, rest in peace, Mr. George Floyd. So it's really difficult to transition from those two incredibly emotional spaces. Um, I do want to share uh, with you tonight, families, um, how proud I am of our school district. Uh, we have met uh, incredible challenges uh, these last 13 weeks, and even before that, uh, to do the very best that we can together in service of the children of our school district and all of you as families in the school district. And I really want to thank you, first and foremost, for your patience, your understanding, uh, but also let you know uh, that your words of encouragement and your words of, of asking us to improve, uh, sometimes with, with anger, sometimes with being upset, um, is also appreciated. We are here to serve you, our community. And I take it very seriously, the responsibility on myself, uh, on behalf of all of our staff and our Board of Education to do the very best job that we can. I also need to congratulate our 2020 graduates. Um, our graduation ceremonies, uh, perhaps weren't what we wished them to be, uh, but I was able to watch every one of them, uh, not all of them live, as there were some competing things. Uh, but I want to thank everyone for uh, making that as special as can possibly be. Um, and again, I know that uh, graduates, you would have preferred to have gathered with your friends and your staff and your families. Um, but again, I want to say congratulations to you. Also to our staff for retiring. Um, uh, again, not an easy way uh, to go out. Uh, when you typically want to celebrate and culminate uh, wonderful careers as an educator and here in SPPS. There are many unknowns that remain, and I'll share updates with you all tonight as best as I can. Um, things aren't changing quite as quickly as they were back in April, I think, when I first joined you. Uh, but nonetheless, there is uh, a great deal of information for us to share tonight with you uh, regarding our plans in the summer and into the coming year. So just to take you back and remind you very quickly, all of this started uh, back in March when we received Executive Order 2002 from Governor Tim Walz. Uh, there were three things central in that Executive Order. 
we were to create essential kid care, child care for St. Paul's essential workers, a place where children could be cared for while their parents worked. We were to provide meals for St. Paul Public School students. Uh, while Chronicle, the job that both of these uh, divisions have done, our essential kid care program, roughly an average of 125 students a day, um, and our meals programs, far over uh, 3 million meals uh, served to this community, just absolutely incredible. And then finally, to create a distance learning plan for St. Paul Public School students. I think each of you has experienced distance learning in your own way. Um, I can tell by the questions I've, I've got today to share with you, the emails I've got, the conversations I've had with you. My own experiences as a, as a leader and as a parent um, experiencing distance learning. It has been quite, uh, quite the learning experience. So let me start with some questions that were submitted by you. And I'll get through as many as I can tonight for you. I worry that there may be many physical health concerns about children returning to school. Um, isn't as much consideration on mental health and how are we uh, preparing to deal with uh, some of the mental health that our, our children are increasingly exposed to, and especially in the past couple of weeks. Uh, yes, that has been an absolute uh, concern for us as we know face-to-face -face interactions and just that loss of relationship in that way has forced us to, uh, to address mental health and student supports in a, in a different way. Uh, to the extent possible, using computer uh, digital meetings and, and Google Meets, uh, also talking via telephone. Um, it is my hope that as we begin to, as Governor Wall says, turn the dial up and come back to more and more face-to-face, -face, that that can be some of the priority spaces that we create uh, in a way, either individually or in small groups, that we're able to work with our students um, in a better way. Uh, families, I know that it has not been ideal uh, for us to be distant when um, relationships are such an important part of the job that we do, and especially as it relates to the supports that some of our students need, the unique supports uh, that some of our students need. So it's definitely uh, something that is on all of our minds and has been a, <clears throat> a great challenge. Another email from a parent wondering about, excuse me, wondering about a distance learning option for the fall. I think right now you uh, should receive today an email from us I'm looking at my parent copy of it. Uh, it came at 2.36, at least mine did today. And uh, the, the Minnesota Department of Education is giving us kind of three parameters for us to work on between now and the start of next school year. And this should not be a surprise to you uh, because I think even back in April, I was sharing uh, these very things with you. Uh, traditional learning, kind of back to normal, um, if, if you will, uh, obviously following the CDC guidelines and the Minnesota Department of Health guidelines. Um, and again, there's a lot to be determined there in terms of where we're at in September. Um, hybrid instruction. Hybrid instruction in and of itself is not really a decision. It is saying it's the space between traditional learning and continued distance learning. So there's a lot of variables in terms of what hybrid might mean for us. And it seems like every time I come up with or I hear uh, what seems like a great solution, uh, there are one, two, three, four, five other things that come up that could be possible barriers to us uh, doing that. So we're definitely going to have to be as flexible um, as possible through these times, and we're going to have to try to find what is the right schedule, what is the right balance for our students, for our staff, for our families, and make that all work. That's our challenge. We have been working on that. We'll work even more on that throughout the rest of the summer. And, of course, the third one is continued distance learning. Uh, continued distance learning, I, I will say to you, based on what we've learned, will not be distance learning as we know it. Um, our team has already begun working on distance learning 2.0, as I've called it, uh, the next version of something that's greater, something that reflects what we've learned <clears throat> from you, from our students, from our staff, uh, to make sure that we can enhance it and make it better uh, with making sure that we're meeting the needs of our students. So having said that, as it relates to what will options be for families, my job and my duty is to provide a free and appropriate public education for the children in the school district. And I will uh, look for any possibility in order to do that. Uh, so what I say to you is that I want to work with every one of you, your family, your, your child, uh, you as a family, uh, to make sure that what we do and the programs that we can offer and how we offer them is right for you. Uh, so we will uh, work on that as we get closer to the summer and we're able to unveil uh, the different ways that we're going to open SPPS back up and what the options might be. But at this time, it would be premature for me to say to you uh, that there are going to be, you know, sign-ups for this version, 
versus that version. We're just not there yet, but we will be. The other piece that I'll mention, this is kind of previewing what I'll get to in some of the additional questions that I've received, is that we do expect by the end of July, not June, the end of July, to get uh, some rather concrete guidance from the Minnesota Department of Health and the CDC that will help us ultimately determine uh, what school is going to look like in September uh, for us. So we've got a plan for everything, uh, which is, um, you know, it's a lot, it's daunting, but truthfully, we've been doing this now for a couple of months, knowing that this time would come, that we would have to make uh, some of those decisions. I should also share with you uh, that I have personally been connecting with superintendents and boards of education around the country. Uh, St. Paul Public Schools is a member of the Council of Great City Schools. You know, 80 of the largest school districts in the country uh, come together weekly. And, and with the unrest due to George Floyd, we've been coming together almost every day um, in meetings just to learn from each other and to see how we're handling the many different uh, hurdles that are, that are thrown our way. Um, what I'll say to you is that we share many of the same concerns, the same questions you're asking are very likely the ones that are being asked in other districts as well. Um, I think there's some of the areas, some of the things during distance learning, St. Paul Public Schools have been leaders uh, around the country and how we've, done, how we've um, dealt with and, and how we've operated. And I'm really proud of, of that work. Uh, nonetheless, I've learned a lot of great things from my colleagues as well, and, and the rest of our team also has met with their peers from around the country and the different divisions that they oversee. So what I want to share with you is the ability for us to bring back to you the many ways uh, that we're going to share uh, the educational opportunities for students uh, come this fall at a later time this summer. But just know traditional with uh, guidelines, uh, distance, better than how we've done now, and some combination in between of how do we have traditional and distance learning side by side intertwined with that schedule. So no real answers for you now, but I want to let you know that your thinking and the questions that you have are the very questions that, that we have too, that we confront ourselves with as we do this planning. Uh, the next question I have is, um, how will social distancing be achieved with class sizes of 20 to 35? Again, these are the exact guidelines that we await. Um, you can imagine that a class size of 20 to 35 versus a lunchroom with 500 during a lunch are two very different things. Uh, you should also know that in our 70 buildings around the district, we you know, go from 200 to 2,000. Um, so there's many different things for us to consider, and I also know that our team is going to have to differentiate that support as well. It might look very different at Harding High School than it does at, let's say, Highland Park Middle School or Highland Park Elementary School, just due to the sheer size. Um, so we have a lot to consider, and what we uh, will really need to do is align uh, those final guidelines uh, with all of our numbers and controlling uh, some of the spaces. Um, in some of the private sectors, I've heard uh, things talked about in terms of neighborhoods where they're reconvening different areas of their workforce and their large congregate sites, and also one-way streets uh, have become very common. I, I know in some of the uh, stores that I frequented just this weekend, uh, lots of arrows and taped on the floors to kind of guide you to where uh, you go, where you enter, and, and how you uh, make your way through different stores. So we're going to have to do uh, some of those things, and um, and I think as we look into the, both the short-term and long-term future, I think a lot of these practices are going to be with us for a while. At least that's how I have to plan. Uh, what are some of the homeschooling options for children with underlying medical respiratory conditions? Again, I think related to what I said with the three different variations uh, that we're looking to develop. Within that, my job again is to support you in finding out what the very best way of, of supporting your child's right to free and appropriate education, public education, is exactly where um, I want to be in understanding that we're going to have to have um, some options for uh, for all of our students for some of the very things that, that you're bringing to my attention. So again, I don't have tonight a form for you to fill out. I don't have a specific flow chart, if you will, uh, to follow for what it could look like. Uh, but please know that this feedback and already in our thinking and our planning, uh, we're thinking about this. I convened about six weeks ago the St. Paul Public Schools Reopening Task Force. We have uh, more 10 or more work groups uh, that are working collaboratively, collaboratively uh, with district staff, um, you know, with our community. A lot of the work that we do will be getting input from you, from our students, and making sure that we are uh, capturing as much as we possibly can about how we can improve at this time. 
Um, if the CDC guidelines are for school to take place, will parents be able to choose to continue distance learning again related to the uh, above? <clears throat> I don't know that we will have options where you get to choose A, B, C, D. Um, it would be more what are the needs that your child presents and how can we support them within the models that we presented to, to make this um, appeasing to, to you as a family and uh, making sure that we can serve your children and support your children in, a, in the most effective way. Uh, let's see. I would like to know if it's possible for parents to see racism curriculum, lesson plans, and SPPS by grade. Um, I think we have a lot of work to do in this area. There's no doubt about it. And um, I can find different evidence of, of anti-racist curriculum and lessons uh, that are taught but as a system. Uh, what are the goals and expectations of what we want our learners to experience in St. Paul Public Schools? In terms of that type of specific curriculum, we've got some work to do. Um, it will be my commitment to you to, to honor this and to make sure that we can be explicit with you. All right, I think we're back, everyone. Um, thank you. Sorry about that. We had some technical difficulties. Um, I, I should share with you as well that we're not going to get through all the questions tonight, but I will come back on uh, throughout the summer to give you some virtual updates like this. So the feedback that we've received has been really uh, positive, so we'll continue to do this. I'll go back um, to the beginning of, of the question, I think, when it cut out. Uh, the question was regarding school resource officers, and um, our Board of Education uh, was scheduled to begin talking about this in our committee of the board meeting tomorrow night. Uh, we have canceled that meeting uh, out of respect to the passing of Chair Zhang. So that meeting will now be on Tuesday the 16th. St. Paul Public Schools does have seven school resource officers that we contract with the St. Paul Police Department. And those seven officers are stationed at our large comprehensive high schools. Um, it's been a relationship that SPP has had for many years. And um, right now, um, the question is, are we going to continue that relationship or not? So typically that contract runs to the end of the school year. So on June 30th, that contract will no longer be in place. Uh, we have scheduled in our normal board meeting in August for us to begin talking about a new contract. Uh, and that's precisely what the board and I are going to discuss um, on the 16th. So I can receive direction from them about the future of our school resource officers. Can we continue distance learning during the summer for those students who are behind their peers to narrow the gap? Uh, we are going to be able to, to do some uh, credit recovery and some programming for our students um, who receive English learner services and also extended school year for students who receive specialized services. In addition, we're going to start SPP of Summer Connects. So it won't be like the summer school that we've had in the past, but it will give our students the opportunity to connect with uh, with our staff throughout the summer. Uh, we'll release more information on that um, as it develops. You can go on our website to St. Paul Connects, and we are looking to collaborate with our community partners and as many people from our district as possible uh, to help our students and our families stay connected with St. Paul Public Schools during the summer. Some expectations for international baccalaureate students, uh, will they be assigned lessons from their teachers? All IB programs have different ways of approaching summer learning. Please contact your school IB coordinator to find out more about what is available at your school. Um, summer sports, will teams be able to participate in any summer activities? Um, you know, this has been incredibly challenging as well in terms of how to use socially distance and follow the guidelines <clears throat> with some of our great summer sports and activities. Um, again, we are working with the State High School League uh, we are giving information to our coaches and our athletic directors. And I really encourage you to get in contact with those individuals um, as it relates. <clears throat> a lot of the activities are, are, are different. Uh, therefore, it may be possible to do some things in those activities, uh, whereas bringing a whole team together to conduct the practice clearly at this time uh, would not be permissible. And it's, it's really a shame. Um, summer learning targets uh, for each grade level class uh, to see what you might be able to reteach or review over the summer. Uh, the Minnesota Department of Education has all the academic standards and learning targets uh, listed. I have websites um, here that it would be too difficult for me to share those with you. I will ask that you post those um, in a comment space on our 
page the information read. <clears throat> I'd like to know if Discovery Club will be happening. Summer, classes will be smaller than nine to one ratios and in pods or classrooms, but in mixing of students. Nursing systems will be in place, safety standards and cleaning practices will be used. Program. So essentially, it's the way we've been operating essential kid care for the duration of Executive Order 2002. With uh, students who are able to keep their iPads through the fall, will they be able to, to learn during the summer? Again, we'll be launching uh, Summer Connects and give up for that. It's one of the main reasons I felt so strongly about making sure that iPads remain uh, in households in the summer. Will there be resources for kids to continue learning during the summer? Again, uh, Summer Connects, I think I've covered that, uh, and we'll make sure that we uh, push out a, a great deal of information on that as it develops and, and is ready to go. All right, um, what lessons has the district learned and what improvements have we made from distance learning? So I'll, I'll share a little bit of that with you, and please know this is not uh, inclusive of everything, and we will continue to gather information as well. Um, without a strong foundation from the referendum to support the personalized learning work, the challenges we would have faced would have been substantial. We have been able to provide devices for 98% of our students. This includes grades pre-K through 12, who enrolled these out-of-district enrollment and foreign exchange students. This was an incredible endeavor. It required the collaboration of our personalized learning team, technology services, operations, teaching and learning staff. That is over 30,000 devices in order to achieve the infrastructure for device management so we could work and locate devices are in place. Two major learning management platforms, CSOUN, SPG, were in place. Teachers had opportunities for professional development. Our partnership with Apple has supported our foundation. Number two, by far, the large majority of our students get participate in online learning. Approximately 82% of students respond to the connection prompt, and 94% of our students in grades 3 through 12 have submitted work in school education. Number three, optimal online learning environments will probably be a blend of synchronous and asynchronous models. And again, uh, drawback or positives and drawbacks to each of those, the scheduling is, I think, one of the greatest challenges. And that's something we're going to have to come uh, to grips with to make sure that we're very clear, uh, both to our staff and to our students and families, uh, what they can expect in terms of those two uh, kinds of schedules. Number four, in order to engage meaningfully, students do need to access to devices and strong internet connections. Phones will not suffice for learning, and connections must be strong to support the video and audio content. Number five, digital learning presents particular challenges for students learning English and student needs and specialized services. It isn't optimal for all learners. And finally, digital learning has placed a large amount of the responsibility for learning with the family and home. Digital learning and online learning, although self-paced, still requires a level of coordination, particularly within one learner in a home, organization and commitment to learning. So, you know, that's just a small sample of some of the things that we've learned that we are really taking to heart as we bring back to you uh, a new model for what this could look like in the fall. I'd like to ask when we'll know what's happening this fall. I've heard of other Metro school districts giving detailed plans to families. Uh, beginning in late June, again, um, you know, those plans are all subject to change. Uh, the Minnesota Department of Education provided us guidelines, and we expect by the end of July uh, to get some final guidelines to help us determine what September <clears throat> will look like for St. Paul Public Schools. So if you had to say today what will fall look like, or do you anticipate uh, normal, or uh, will we be in distance learning? Um, again, I think it's going to be somewhere in between, again, how and what will each schedule look like, I think is, is the work that we can do, um, collaboration with you and, and many, many others. So I don't want to make a guess right now, uh, as you know, the development with COVID-19 <clears throat> and some of the care and the medical treatments are ongoing and developing. Uh, you also know as we begin to reopen, um, we may be learning other things about communities near and far. Um, about the array of spread. So we have a lot to learn in these coming days and weeks and that are going to help us prepare for uh, for September. 
most of these questions again are, are related to distance learning and what the file will look like. Um, options, you know, making sure that we uh, can provide you as many options as possible. When will you know? You'll know as soon as I have information to share with you, as I mentioned. Um, I will continue to hold these sessions uh, throughout the summer um, to give you updates as I know them. Um, we'll communicate with you in various ways uh, to make sure that you are um, in the loop to the extent possible. Um, concerns about students passing their present grade. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I mean, our, our great teaching is all about assessing uh, where students are at in terms of their development and developing the appropriate support so they can improve. And I, I can tell you that, that right now, uh, grade levels might not be the best way to indicate, indicate student progress just in terms of how we think about it in a traditional way. Uh, there is no doubt at all that we serve a wide range of students um, in, in their ability to access content and to succeed in school. Um, and the grade levels as a way for us to organize our students. Uh, we're going to have to look far beyond that, and we're going to have to make sure that we do uh, very much have a, an individual plan for every student, not just to catch up, but to be excellent, uh, to be supported, and to be confident as a reintegrated member of our school district as we um, inch back to uh, school as we knew it in our tradition, traditional sense. Let me get to a couple more here. I'm going to skip to a couple more categories to see if we can get uh, some other questions. Uh, what is school doing to uh, address decreasing enrollment? Yeah, it's absolutely a great question. It's been something that's plagued us for a number of years now, uh, declining enrollment as it relates to um, our ability, uh, whether it's a budget or programs that we offer um, or some of the size and scales in our schools. It really has become challenging. Um, you may recall back in the fall, we started an initiative called uh, Envision SPPS. And that was us to um, form various work groups that we could pull together a great understanding of our district. Uh, we could uh, seek information from families who have, choose, who have chosen to leave us. And we could begin to put uh, recommendations forward to our board for how we can both increase opportunities and programs in our district and look at what, is the, uh, what are the uh, programs and, and schools that are, uh, that are most often uh, requested in our district and learn from those, learn from those schools and learn what can we do to increase those kinds of opportunities, um, whether it be a transportation barrier that we have, whether it um, be how we spread out <clears throat> the various programs we have throughout the city. Um, you know, these and, and many, many more things are all things that we continue to look at. Now, I will share with you that that plan has, has definitely taken, has gotten a little bit of a rest, uh, but it's going to be even more important as we move through uh, the future as it relates to this uh, this time in our uh, in our history with COVID-19 and, and the shutdown in terms of the work that we have at hand. So um, Envision SPPS is something that I want you to become familiar with. Uh, but eventually, it will be part of, of what we do in looking at the operations, the operational um, index of our, of our school district. And enrollment um, sustainability is a big piece of that. I'd love to increase our enrollment. And I uh, I do think that as we look at some of the programs we're able to offer, and especially as it relates to online learning, uh, there are some things that we're going to be able to do that perhaps could make St. Paul Public Schools competitive in a new and different way as well, uh, while also strengthening our in-school programs. Um, finally, let me get to just one last question here. Um, this is really a question about um, our multi-language speaking communities and and how difficult it's been for this rapid changing um, information um, coming out to, to families who English isn't their spoken language. It has is, been a real challenge. Our family engagement and um, uh, community um, teams have, have been so integral and in, in working so hard to keep our families connected. It has been uh, an incredible challenge. It is my commitment, it is our team's commitment uh, to make sure that we are translating our information as quickly as possible so that all of our families are receiving the same information at the same time. And although I list that as a challenge, it is not an excuse. It is something that I will <clears throat> continue to champion and work on with my team uh, to make sure we're doing this in the most equitable way possible. Uh, to those of you who have felt exact words left in the dark, I really apologize for that. Um, I sincerely do. It is not 
at all a reflection of, of how we value our children, our families, and our community. Um, so please continue to, to uh, give us feedback for ways that we can improve as it relates to that. So folks, I spent through some of those. There were a lot of questions were somewhat um, not redundant, but of the same um, theme and, and content with what to expect in the fall. Again, as we come to a close here, um, a school year like none that I've ever experienced and one that I hope I never have to experience again. I wanna thank you for your incredible uh, patience, um, your encouragement, um, your persistence in making sure that we do better, uh, even though there's these difficulties that we face. Uh, that's what we're here for. Um, you have my commitment that we'll work as hard as we can uh, to come up with the very best in, in options based on the guidelines that we get. We'll communicate it to you in a way that makes sense and we will focus on making sure that every child in our school district from birth to 12 plus um, has nothing but a, a great experience in St. Paul Public Schools. Um, I wish you great peace in these coming days and, and weeks and months. I hope we can stay connected uh, throughout the summer. And uh, again, just want to, on behalf of the Board of Education, thank you so much for believing in St. Paul Public Schools. Um, and with that, wish you a great evening. Thank you, everyone.